Hey guys, good morning from Bali. This is Bud coming at you. It's 8.46, just one minute late. And I got my friend here, Mr. Marcus, who's also a trader. Hello, Marcus. Hello, happy to be here. Sorry. Magnus, you can correct me. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right, give me a second here. Turning off that one. There we go. All right, so thank you guys for coming. Thank you for already hitting that like. We've got two people watching, three people in the like. Uh, if you're not on mobile, hit that live chat and chat with us. If you're on mobile and driving, please don't live chat while driving. And uh, we're going to get going here today, and we're going to ask some Magnus some questions, because he's a very different trader than I am. Uh, but we've been sharing information. He's now living in Bali. How long have you been living in Indonesia? I've been in Indonesia for three and a half years. And uh, yeah, I fell in love with uh, Southeast Asia. It's an amazing part of the world. Highly recommend coming here and checking this region out. It's a very exciting region. A lot going on. And the sun is shining and uh, many interesting people here. Yeah, the sun was actually really great today. I went to the beach. We're only about five minutes from the beach from where we are. And uh, yeah, three and a half years. I've been here three years pretty much in Bali. But you've been in Jakarta mostly. I was in the capital for three years before COVID made uh, me able to work remotely as everyone else. So I took advantage of that. Gotcha. Cool. All right, guys, we're going through and we're doing some of our scans. Um, and the internet's a bit slow today. I apologize if there's any lag or any issues with that. In Indonesia, it's always a competition. Uh, who has the worst Wi-Fi? <laughs> I, uh, I feel it uh, all the time myself. Yeah, you called it something good today. You said Wi-Fi... Wi-Fi anxiety. Anxiety. Uh, constant Wi-Fi anxiety. They have the most expensive co-working space membership I could find, but it's still not good enough. Yes, yeah. Uh, I also do online events and I get that, I drop out of the event every now and then during the event. It's, um, it's really hard to get good Wi-Fi, unfortunately. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Hey guys, I want to take a quick moment and remind you guys that I do this not just to make money, but also to live forever. And I want you guys to make money and live forever. So do check out sends.org where they are working on curing aging. Um, this guy, Aubrey de Grey, started it. He poured his own money into it. And they are continuing to raise money to promote the idea that we even can cure aging, that this isn't just science fiction. We can make it science fact. And I do want you guys to go check that out. And also, quick plug, check out the optionsoracle.com. They've been doing uh, option market signals since 2009. They show their trades on there. And remember, it's a 30-day free trial, no risk to you guys. You can use it, make money. If, it, if, you, if you like it and you made money, you can use that obviously to pay moving forward. It's only $97 a month. Now, how much options trading do you do? I have uh, actually never traded options. So uh, but I met you recently and uh, very interesting to, uh, to talk to you about it and learn more. Gotcha. It's something I'd like to learn so more. So what do you about. mostly do? Mostly I've been going long, long stocks uh, that I know more, know something about, where I feel like I have a, some kind of an edge or I feel there's a good value case. But uh, <clears throat> I, I do have the, um, Paul Tudor Jones, he once lectured uh, a class in university in, in the US and he, he had a blackboard and he made a chart uh, up to the upward to the right, to the middle of the black, blackboard. And he asked the students, would you buy or would you sell? And, um, and um, to the half of the class, or the part of the class that said that they would sell this stock, he said that you should never ever manage your own money because you have the contrarian bug. Uh, and, and I have the contrarian bug. Okay. So recently I've been trying to uh, start betting on, on, on fall uh, on some stocks that I believe are overpriced. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I want to bring up this one because you were talking about, and this is what got me interested. Because I would, I would never really look into this company. New York Times, you know, most of the newspapers are kind of dying. Most of the news medias are kind of dying. Um, but you said that they've really turned it around. Can you <coughs> tell us about, exactly about that? Right. So the newspaper business used to be a, a gold mine um, for many, many years uh, until until the internet really took off and um, and they uh, got desperate to try to make money with advertisements and it didn't really work 
and uh, it looked like the New York Times would uh, die after 170 years uh, of operations. But uh, what they did, they managed to completely turn the company around and uh, move from a, an, an advertisement uh, model, uh, which was the conventional truth that now the newspaper has to sell advertisement, they have to uh, make clickbaity articles and they have to make money by advertisements. But they turned it around and they, they converted their business model into a subscription-based model. Um, <clears throat> back to a subscription-based model, they got some really good tech talent from some of the large tech companies, including I think Facebook and Amazon. They really turned around the company, built the tech infrastructure and um, digital marketing and made a very beautiful app. And, um, and they also got rid of a lot of debt that they had and um, and uh, now it, it looks like um, it will be the, the, the media company of the world more or less uh, because <coughs> New York Times is taking a different approach than most other media companies and newspapers where they actually they're hiring people they're, they're paying 3-4x what other companies are doing uh, so they get the best talent and uh, while other companies are cutting uh, staff, cutting journalists, they're, they're investing in, in journalists, in, in top talent. And um, what's also really interesting is that New York Times business model is actually quite similar to Netflix and Spot uh, Spotify, but you could argue that it's actually a better model because um, in Spotify's case, they have to pay uh, royalties every time someone streams a song, from mm -hmm. my understanding. So every time someone streams a song, they have to pay money. Netflix, they they have to pay royalties for the movies. They make a lot of movies themselves, but that's very expensive. New York Times basically have to pay the, the salaries of the journalists. And the they journalists. own the content forever. Yes, it's a little bit perishable, maybe. You can argue some of the news are not so relevant in a, in a few weeks, months or years. But some of it is. Right. And um, they were also able to, to tap into uh, the archive of New York Times uh, with, with 170 years of recipes and crossword puzzles, mm -hmm. which they put into two beautiful apps where people actually pay for access to crosswords and recipes. Right, right. Um, yeah, I thought that was interesting. And it makes sense, right? Like, especially for the older generation that grew up with the New York Times to go back and have any of those crossword puzzles or it's just there's a lot of nostalgia right to anyone that's probably not I think and older in my generation maybe my generation maybe not the younger generations maybe though but like old recipes of like foods and uh, stuff that you wouldn't even think to use anymore is gonna keep being in that in that 170 year old app right? they own it right right they paid the journalist uh, 120 years ago right his salary right and then they're just making money off it again and again and again in some ways they can actually uh, they digitize their, their arch archives right um, and if you look at the the five-year chart it's nothing but up except for this most recent down pull <coughs> right but otherwise it's a very clear trending upwards and what's another one we could look up uh, but I thought that was very interesting, and this is again a company that I probably wouldn't have given a second glance to, uh, unless you had talked about it and said what you said, and you've already done the research, you know. So now you've kind of got me thinking maybe this is something that might I want to invest in. So how are you making a play on this? Or is it just buy and hold? So so I um, I think that the market will will fall uh, in general. So uh, I haven't bought any yet, but I would like to buy it. Uh, if we get a significant correction, okay. which I believe is coming. Um, so currently I'm not buying, eager to buy, but I think I can get it cheaper a little bit in the future. Sure. And sure. so, yeah, maybe uh, selling put options on New York Times could be a very attractive strategy after talking to you. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and take a look <laughs> at it. I think last time we thought that maybe it didn't have the volatility. It's only 31%. Let's take a look at it, guys. We've only got 31% IVX, so that's going to be super low, but right now it's currently trading at 40.90, so we could say that at the money is about 41. You can get $1.20 at the money. What happened here? Something doesn't look right. There we go. Okay. 
It's going to give you a break even of $39.80. 120 out of 41 gives you only a 3% return. So 3% at the money doesn't really fit any of the criteria that I have for my own trading. Uh, however, if I just wanted to buy and hold this, that is a 3% discount until it finally gets assigned to you. And then it gets assigned to you at 39.80 out of 30 out of sorry, out of 41, which I think is just going to be the 3% anyway. Yeah, exactly a 3%. So you're not gaining a whole lot there. But you could come down a little bit further, maybe to the 39, pick it up at about 60 cents. Now you're only making one and a half, so you're, you're not making 3%, you're only making 1.5%, but again, that's 37 days, so you can do that maybe 10, 11 times a year, that starts to add up. If it ever does get assigned to you, now your break even is 38.45 versus the 41, whoops, 41.00. Now you're getting a 6% discount, right? But when does it happen? If it happens this month, then you just got it at a 6% discount. But if you go six months, then you've made six times 1.5. So what is that, about 9% plus the 6% discount? That gives you a 15% discount overall. Beats the bank. Yes, it does beat the bank, absolutely. Um, so again, I, I conservative with the way I use the wheel strategy. I figure there's about three different ways that I see people use the wheel strategy. You've got these crazy hand grenade jugglers that are doing the wheel on AMC and GME and other meme stocks, and they're doing it weekly to try and make as big a buck as possible over a few months. But every time they're doing that, that thing could tank 50, 60, 70% at the dime if the market turns against it. What do you think about AMC and GME, by the way? <clears throat> I mean, this reminds me of uh, one of my favorite authors, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. <clears throat> and it seems like the AMC and GME strategy is um, like uh, picking up nickels in front of the bulldozer. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, you look very smart. You make some money until the bulldozer runs you over. It's game over, right? Right. Uh, is, is that correctly understood? The, the way that they play options on these extremely speculative. Right. And to uh, me, it companies. doesn't even make sense. But you're right. You also you you said it. You look smart until it finally runs you over. And it's so annoying because you're trying to help other people and trying to educate people on how to use these strategies, and then they're doing it wrong but then they're making a bunch of money until they don't exactly. and so ha who wants to listen to you if you're making a bunch of money doing something you're less likely to listen to anybody telling you you're doing it wrong exactly right but here's what my perspective is i want to use this i look at the wheel strategy as an overall safe strategy everything that i'm doing in the wheel is creating more safety whether i apply it to new york times even amc or other things i'm creating margins of safety and i'm getting high probability on my trades if I'm going to go trade hand grenades like AMC and GME, I would do the complete opposite. Instead of selling calls and selling puts, I'd be buying calls and buying puts and trying to get the maximum value out of my dollar. In fact, I talked about this before and kind of maybe I should do it, but we could take a portfolio, 10,000, 100,000, whatever, put 90% of that into selling options and use the premium from that to buy options on AMC, GME and try and get that outpaced return, right? That's how I'd be playing it. Instead of picking up nickels in front of a steamroller, let's go ahead and roll the dice in front of the steamroller and try and win big, right? If you're gonna buy lottery tickets, buy lottery tickets. And don't, don't buy scratch-offs that make five bucks. Try and get the million dollar lottery ticket, right? Try and make it something big. I, I'm still not gonna do that, I don't think, right now anyway. But <clears throat> what I wanna get across is that the wheel strategy is a safety building strategy. You should be using it to do safe trades. And the way I do that is I try and stick to companies that have what I feel is the right mix of safety and volatility. So uh, you know, I'd rather be doing SPCE or Tesla or other growth companies that have good future income, that have good runways, they have good liability, so that we have good fundamentals. Even if they're pre-revenue, they're good fundamental companies that they're not going to blow up like AMC and GME that are meme stocks like that. The other thing I see people doing at the wheel is going ultra conservative. They're doing it on blue chips. They're doing it on Apple and IBM. Maybe not IBM. We've talked about that one before. But right, but blue chips, big stocks, um, P&G, all these other type of companies that are massive. They're not going to go away. And they're just trying to squeak out that half to 1% a month because at the end of the year, that's still 12% a year. And they're not risking. They, they're in a position where they feel like they can't risk or lose their money. And I feel like if you are close to retirement or you're even in retirement, then that's a great strategy because you're not really trying to grow your portfolio. You're trying to earn premium or earn monthly income without losing anything. Is that selling puts? 
selling puts and then selling calls if you get assigned. You can do both. Okay. And you can actually do both simultaneously, right? You could buy 100 shares, sell the call on those 100 shares while simultaneously selling puts, earning premium on both. If the put goes against you, your call is actually gonna expire faster, which lets you roll it again. And then you can buy another 100 shares, now you have 200 shares to sell calls against. And you can do that. But I think that's a really great strategy if you're in a, if you're in an older generation and you don't have the working years ahead of you, right? I'm 38, how old are you? 31. 31, right? So if necessary, if we were to somehow lose our money, we could still go back to work. If we're 65, that's gonna be a lot harder to go back to work and rebuild yeah. all that capital. Yeah. So definitely wouldn't be using the AMC GME strategy at that age, but maybe I'd even be more conservative than I am now. But right now I try and squeak out, I'm really trying to get, my minimum goal by the way, is 25% a year. If I'm not getting 25% a year, I should go back to real estate. That's that's my mindset, right? 25%. I could be doing, I, I could even with COVID, I could be doing Airbnb, maybe I could do some builds, or I could do some long-term holds. I expect <laughs> in real estate, I can get 15 to 20% IRR, right? But if I'm gonna be doing this, and there's things I don't like about real estate, so there's other reasons why I don't wanna go back to real estate, but if I'm not beating real estate, then shouldn't I be in real estate? Right, that's kind of my mindset. So I'm trying to get 25% a year, but in order to get 25% a year, I'm not gonna shoot for 25% a year, because if I come up a little bit short, then I'm under it. I'm really shooting for 50, 60% a year, as long as the market continues to give that to me. Right, I adjust to the market, but if I'm getting a 5% a year, uh, sorry, excuse me, 5% a month, that's 60% a year before compounding. After compounding, it actually works out to about 80% a year. Now, well, that's last year, it's 5% a month. It was. It was last year. Things have kind of calmed down. Two things happened. The market has kind of calmed down a little bit, so it's harder to get 5% on more companies. Also, I look back at what I was doing, and I was basically only in two sectors, right? Tech and growth, right? And nothing, mostly all just tech. Either software or hardware, it was all tech, 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 tech. So now I'm saying, you know what? I'm going to lower my goal a little bit. I'm gonna take three and a half, four percent, four and a half percent. I'll be in that type of range, but now I'm in more sectors. So now I have something in cannabis, I have something in tech, I have something in space, I have a few other different things, right? I've got a wider variety of stocks that I can sell puts on because I'm not trying to get that 5%. I'm not super aggressive with the market anymore. But I'm also not super crazy trying to get 10% on AMC and GME and stuff like that. That's what they pay a month, 10%. Yeah, something like that. Let's go look at it real quick. Not that I'm recommending this to anyone. Please don't go do this. But uh, we might have some issues. Okay. Look at that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, just look at what we just looked at before. New York Times, 30% IVX. AMC, 272% IVX. Okay. And actually, it's 300 if you go less than. So let's go 23 days out and see what we could get. Okay. At the money. Currently trading at 52, so we actually, why is it showing it there? Okay, let's go down. This is really at the money, 52. You're getting $16.40. You're getting a 31% return in 23 days. For that's, selling puts. That's actually kind of crazy, right? That wow. actually becomes, right. But here's the thing, can you actually hold it for 23 days? It's, it's cinemas, <laughs> right? It's cinemas. A hundred year old cinema companies loaded, loaded with debt. Yeah. Um. I was, I posted something on Facebook and, and the AMC crowd came out and attacked me. And they're like, what, but space, because I was, I was using um, Virgin Galactic as an example. And they're like, it has no revenue. I'm like, they put people in space. AMC can't even put people in theaters right now. <laughs> you know, which company has a better future? Because stocks are forward looking. They're not backwards looking, right? We're still recovering from COVID. AMC has a ton of debt. They basically should be going bankrupt, except for these memes are pushing it sky high. But once the pin gets pulled out on these, what well, is basically a pump and dump. That's the thing people need to understand. This is not new to me. I've been trading crypto since 2017. No, sorry, 2016, I've been in crypto and I've been super actively trading crypto since 2017. I am fully versed in pump and dumps. And all this is, is the crypto version of a pump and dump. Instead of it being like a centralized hedge fund or shorting fund or anything like that, this is what we call, I call it, a centralized pump and dump. It's people 
working together anonymously mostly on Reddit, on forums, on chat room groups, picking a stock, blowing it up, pumping it up, but it's a game of hot potato. And the way you win hot potato is you hold the hot potato just before the music ends and then you give it to somebody else. You, you don't want to ever want to be the person, the last person holding that stock, holding that hot potato, because it's just going to tank, it's just going to drop like a rock. So these pump and dumps, especially in crypto, the way they work is they build up a community as large as possible and they tell people, we're going to tell you when we're going to sell, hold until then, everyone hodl, blah, 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 and they do it. They work together and they get the price up, but guess what? The guys running the show, they're the first to sell. After they sell, they're going to tell their inner circle. After the inner circle sells, they're going to tell the second circle. After the second circle, maybe they tell you in the public, right? You don't know where you are. And by the way, you might think you're in the inner circle. You might be in the fourth inner circle, right? You might be four circles out from the inner circle. By the time it reaches you, they don't have to tell you. You can see it on the charts, right? Right. <laughs> right. Because... And so the way you play against that is you try and sell ahead of when they're actually going to sell. Right? Instead of waiting for the absolute peak or waiting for them to say anything, you're wa actively watching it and then like you said, as soon as you see it or as soon as you think, as soon as it spikes high enough, you pick your target, boom, you're out because that's the only way you're going to get out safe. But it's such a dangerous game, it <coughs> makes a ton of money quickly, so, but so, it's so dangerous. So I mean, you're getting paid 31.5% to hold this hot potato. To, to you picking up nickels in front of the bulldozer for 30 days, right? But it's a very dangerous bulldozer. It's a very big we nickel, know, actually. <laughs> we know that the person picking nickels at some point will get killed right. by this bulldozer. You cannot, you, there's no way you could do this month after month. You'd be lucky if you got 23 days out of this, right? 23 days. Yeah. Now here's 23 the thing. Nerve, nerve wrecking days. Yeah, right? <laughs> That's a fat reward though. That's I can see why people get greedy, right? Because look at this, this is 31% and you think you have downside protection because really you don't lose money till it goes down to 3560. So the stock has to go below 3560, but every penny after 3560, that's a penny of your money going away, right? There, there's this You're is not a shareholder of right. this company. Right. You now have a one-to-one -one relationship. I'll tell you what though. If for some reason I thought I was just going to buy and wait for this to go up, I'd probably be better off selling the put right now because you're at least getting, you're at least getting a, a break-even price of 35.60. Whereas everyone else buying right now, their break-even price is 52. But here's what you miss out on: you don't have a one-to-one -one relationship on it going up. If it actually went up 30 dollars, you don't get 30 dollars. Well, you get whatever you get. You get 16 dollars here. You just get it sooner. That's all you're getting. But anyway, you got to pick your goals. You got to pick your targets. Maybe you do something like this with a small portion of your portfolio. You wouldn't do this with your life, save, life savings, I hope not anyway. But there's people out there that are doing it because they don't even know any better. They don't have a, another different strategy and all their friends are getting rich like you said and, or they see all these other people talking about making money, which also goes back to confirmation bias, right? Everyone loves to brag about how much money they make. They don't show up the next day and say how much money they lost. Exactly. Or at least not all of them, right? Nine out of 10 will come brag, <laughs> but not nine out of 10 won't come and tell you that they just lost their ass. And I'm thinking as well, right, like why are you getting paid this much money to hold that for 23 days? Well, there's someone on the other side who believes that that's a good deal. Right. Well, they're so buying the buy put. puts at that price, right? Right. right. That's they're buying the put. thinking about. I mean, yeah. And for them, once it gets down to 3560, every penny you lose is a penny they make. Hmm. Times 100. In <laughs> 23 days. Such a short term. Yeah. It's crazy. It's actually nuts. It's actually nuts. But I'll tell you what I see on a lot of the Facebook forums is they're coming in and they're doing like a nine day and maybe they'll pick something out. Let me get my deltas up here. And they'll pick something down here and they might sell this for 375. Why is it not? Okay, it's not calculating. 375, right? So now their break even is 34.25. So it's pretty close to the 23 day, but they have no intention of writing this out nine days. Their whole goal is they're in it today and they're out either today or in two days. But they still call it the wheel strategy. That is not the wheel strategy at all. You're scalping. Just like if you were buying during the pump and dump, you're just scalping. You're trying to get in and you're trying to get out and you're watching the market the whole time that you're doing it. And you're looking for, okay, it's gonna go down, boom, I'm out. Or it goes up a little bit, boom, I collect my profit, I'm out. To me, that's a day trading strategy. It takes up a ton of time, creates a ton of stress, 
and maybe you make money. Mm. Alright, it's so nine. Why are they not holding it for nine days? Because I believe they can make a small profit and then they just... They're not trying to. They're not trying to make 375, right? If they get this, maybe they're trying to get 30 cents, 50 cents a buck out of it, times 100 shares, right? They're just trying to... They're just like a day trader. Day trader has no intention of holding a company. They don't care if it's a bad company, right? They're just looking at the price action and they're saying, okay, when this goes up 10 cents, I'm going to sell. If it goes down 5 cents, I'm going to sell, right? And I'm just going to try and double my, I'm, I'm trying to have, trying to make more than I lose. Mm -hmm. And that's it. <laughs> and they're trying to get in and out, in and out. They're not trying <coughs> to hold and let, let it expire. Now, personally, that's fine. It's a very active way of doing it. If you're going to do that, you better be in the market 8 hours a day, 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day. That's hard for us to do in Bali. We gotta go to sleep. <laughs> you better be uh, monitoring it on your smartphone and having notifications on and vibration and whatever you have. Have the alerts sending to you. Me, 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 me went down five cents. Me, 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 me went up five cents. What a horrible way to spend your days. Yeah, not my style. But that's crazy. Anyway, we got nine, 11, nine, twelve. Now we got about twenty-eight minutes. No, eighteen minutes before the opening bell. Let's go check our scanner. See if we've got anything coming up. By the way, let me know if you guys have any questions. Can't see the top of the screen. Yeah, I cut off a little bit off the top. You should be able to see most of it. Okay. How's it going, guys? Hey, Gage, how you doing? Love seeing you, guy. Hey, guy, I haven't seen you in a while, guy. Where you been, brother? Feels like I haven't seen you for a week or two. <coughs> oh, but I guess I'm on Tastyworks. I might be cutting off too much, yeah? Ah, it is cutting off too much. All right, I'll adjust that on the next one. I don't know. I do. I wanted to not show all of the links and everything up there all the time. All right, there we go. That might be better. Guy says, watching these dull markets. Go do some AMC, man. If it's too dull for you. Nah, I'm kidding. All right, so we've got our put option scanner going for us. For those of you who don't know much about put options, ask me any questions you want in the live chat. That's why we're here. We're gonna be here for nine till 9.45, so we got 30 more minutes with you. See, 30 minutes has already gone by. Does it feel like 30 minutes? Time flies, yeah. your company. All right, so Apron, Blue Apron, that's one of those home delivery meal kit companies, and they're not the best one of them. Um, I did a few trades on them last year. I don't think I'm interested in doing any more on them. Um, and I don't think that this is a copyright free music. I have to change this. Hold on guys. <laughs> that me I'm probably gonna get this video taken down. Bummer. Give me just a second. If anyone puts up these copyright free musics, always make sure it's at least an hour long or, or repeat or something. Jeez. Hey. Gonna run into a copyright issue. Alright, Expa, Express PA Group. Health and wellness, not really that interested in those. India Capital Growth, India Capital Growth Fund, close in an equity mutual fund. 10% 37 days. Genius Brands International, content and brand management company. We've looked at them a few times. Jinx Solar, not too interested in solar. I've got enough exposure on Tesla. They're also in the solar game. Celsius. Uh, Celsius. This actually did well for me, I think, last time. I don't think I have any positions open on Celsius anymore, but I actually did like the company. Yeah. So I've got no openings on them. Nothing open on them. Alright. They're on a massive run-up, though. What do you think about this chart? If you were just looking at this, run us through your process, because these guys hear me every single day. Oh, go ahead. Hmm. I mean, it looks, looks very strong, right? Obviously, it broke out uh, above the previous top pair. Mm-hmm. Um, seems like it had good support in the round, around the $48 area. A massive takeoff here. That's it. I'm contrarian, right? So, uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know. It uh, looks... Uh, yeah. 
I don't know that much about this company. Sure. But uh, looks like it's going up for sure. So the revenue quarter over quarter is up 77%. Year over year is 71%. Massive growth company. I forget all the notes I have. Ooh, let's, do I have them in my sheet? Uh, I had them listed to do next time. We can do it now then. Give me a second. Let's bring that over here. All right, so 77 and 71. Let's put that in our sheet. Asset liability ratio, we've got 39 to 148. 48, 26%, that's fantastic. By the way, I think that's really healthy because that shows that they're they're borrowing money, probably they didn't even have to, but they wanna keep being aggressive and actually do something with it, All right? 26.3, whereas if you see them have zero debt, why do they have zero debt? Why aren't they trying to go faster? And they are profitable over the last four quarters. They turned profitable in 2019, so they've got a track record of two years profitability, making close to 10 million, excuse me, I almost said billion, but 10 million a year. Cash on hand is 43. So we'd say even if they went back to negative, they would have four years worth of runway. So that's plenty. And anytime we were super positive, I just put a 100 in here. So if we look at just these numbers, this puts them very near the top on our ratings because they have very low debt. They're well below 70%. They're even below 50, 40%. They have profitable, I'm sorry, they are profitable and they have double digit, very high double digit revenue quarter over quarter and year over year. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Talked about this with Magnus as well. Their intangibles here are 26.8. I believe, let's go look at the company again. Where is their profile? For its master brand Celsius, I think this is the fat burning or energy one, yeah. A lifestyle fitness drink and pioneer in the rapidly growing performance energy sector, Celsius has five beverage lines that each offer proprietary, fu proprietary functional healthy energy formulas clinically proven to offer significant health benefits to its users. Five lines include original heat, energy, on the go, and sweetened with stevia. So it's kind of like the new Red Bull. Yep. But for whatever reason, it's growing very, very rapidly, just like Red Bull did, but this is becoming very popular. Um, I was not in America when this came out. Have you ever heard of this company or these drinks? No. Not, nothing in Norway, right? Never. No. <laughs> and that's, that's one of the problems that holds me back sometimes in investing in a company like this is I'd want to go out and try the drink and see how it actually tastes. But that's not really that feasible here in Bali. U.S. is such a big market, right? You can you can just keep growing in that market for many years before you have to go outside, I guess. Yeah. So let's look at the questions here. Hey, Wayne, you're finally back. Haven't seen you for a week as well. Jay, yeah, I actually had to turn the CCR music off. That's uh, that's copyright. It was on an autoplay on YouTube. Of course, YouTube's still gonna flag me for it. Glenn says, "What scanner are you using?" That's actually my scanner. I had it custom made. Um, you got some good music going. Thank you. Yeah, you can't open Easy Option Scan, Chris. That's my website. Uh, Wayne says, order some on Amazon. That would have to come through customs. What would you think that would cost to bring a case of soda, basically soda energy drink from the US, just in customs, not even in shipping? The weight would be heavy too. Shipping liquid is always so heavy. Yeah, 30, 40% maybe extra. It'd be worth it, right? Yeah, it if you're gonna invest it. in the company. Absolutely. Let's order some. All right, we're gonna try and figure out how to order some, maybe. But I do like everything about this company so far. Next earning date is in August, so we've got plenty of time. We have 57 days. Current price is 72.45. So the only thing that scares me, uh, sorry, my dogs are playing. Uh, the only thing that scares me about this company is actually the stock <coughs> sorry, price action going up and down, and this recent breakout. So we basically be, if we were to sell puts or buy right now, we'd be buying at the all-time high. That's the only thing that worries me. Does that ever worry you, or do you like it that? It worries me too, of course, yeah, as okay. a contrarian. What do you guys think? Hey guys, in the chat room, let me know. 
because I actually, I've done the research, I've done a trade on this company before, closed it early, it was super profitable, I like everything else about the company, I don't remember all of my research, but I remember the research is good. That's all I really care to remember most of the time is what was the outcome of my research. I like this company, but what do you guys in the chat room think about this chart cycle, right? Imagine that you just know that this company is good and you don't know what they do. Would you be happy and confident selling puts and buying shares in a company like this? Basically, do you want to go long when you see a chart like this? Or would you be, you know, uh, more weary and uh, wary and holding back? All right, Wayne Bicknell has some good comments. He has covered short puts on ABBV, BMY, IBM. You, you have some thoughts on IBM, right? Yeah, I'm bearish. Uh, okay, on we'll IBM get to that too. in just a second. Triple M, PRU, UNM, and MO, all just before they go X dividend. So those of you that don't know Wayne, Wayne is what I consider more like the more conservative or ultra conservative. He's looking for blue chips and he likes to do them on what we call, what is it called, the triple income strategy. The triple income strategy is when you can do everything. You make money on the puts, you make money on the calls, and while you hold the shares, you make money on the dividends. So you can use the wheel strategy on dividend paying companies, and, but he's mostly dealing with a retirement account. So for him, he's trying to stay super safe, but also get enough money coming in that he's not depleting his retirement fund. He might actually be growing his retirement fund, but he's living off of his premiums. But with that in mind, we've got seven, eight minutes before the bell goes, Please tell us what you think and have found about IBM, and I'll bring it up here on the chart for us. Yeah, so <clears throat> I don't remember all the details, uh, unfortunately, any longer, but um, uh, I, I heard about it through Jim, Jim Chanos, a legendary short seller uh, who uh, revealed the Enron scam back in the early 2000s. Oh, he did? And, and he says it's, it's his favorite short of all his shorts right now. Um, because he, uh, he he writes that it's um, basically financial engineering. They they make much less money than or half what what they say they do, um, and they normally trade on 10x earnings. And he believes it's around six six dollars instead of twelve. So um, okay, let's go. Let's go to the chart real quick. So you're saying. And the whole company is in, has been in decline, right, for yeah. many, many years. So it, it kind of feels good to. I, I can sleep well at night with my short position there uh, because it's uh, the whole company is basically on slow, it's a slow yeah. sh sinking ship, right? Yeah. Over since <coughs> 2010 to 2020, they've gone down from 197 to 148. So they're going down a couple bucks a year, with some major. Made, like I mean, they were basically lower than they are now, and then they pop back up, then drop, then pop back up. So we're probably right next, ready for the next drop if this continues. Yeah, it looks like this is the roof of the downward trend. Yep. And you were saying earnings per share was half of what they claim it is, basically. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. And if that's true, then all of these numbers are going to be thrown off. And here's what we found <coughs> looking at this the other day on IBM is look at their liabilities, right? 127 to 148, that's 85, almost almost 86%, right? They've only got 14% left in the books. But guess what happens, right? If they're cooking the books, if they're putting forward sales that haven't happened yet or contracts that might not go through, where do you think this number really is? And the other thing is look at the goodwill and intangible assets because these are numbers that I don't know. They're not really solid, right? It's not like real estate. It's not like hardware that you own. How much of this is brand and how quickly can that brand turn negative? So how much of a discount do you want to give this? Well, even if you shave off only 20% off of this, it completely throws off your asset to liability ratio. If you take 20 million off of this brand, brand and patent value, you're basically insolvent on this company. What does Wayne, Wayne say? Wayne has some comments there. Sure. Um, Wayne, would expect a pullback before I sold. Okay, so he's talking about CHL, so he's waiting for a pullback. I've worked with IBM as a service provider of my company and know many employees over there. They are evolving. IBM is not a company that would cook the books. Okay. Any comment? Uh, let, let's see, <laughs> let's see. This will be very interesting. Uh, I, I think... Uh, 
to me it seems like the company is like on a slow slow long decline not only the share price but, but the business model I don't know yeah when Wayne um, says they are evolving but when you got a massive company a massive old dinosaur like IBM worth 131 billion dollars they of course they're gonna say they're evolving but are they in a company that big when you're a CEO when you're getting paid tens of millions or what do they get paid is it, is it gonna show us here Compensation, executive chairman of the board, 20 million a year, 9 million a year, 7 million a year. When you're making over 5 million a year working at this company, do you want to buck the trend? Do you want to throw any, do you want to start anything that could give you negative press, negative publicity, negative pushback, create a little bit of a wedge for somebody to come in and take your job? Or are you going to try and keep things slow and steady and just keep collecting that paycheck? And look at the age. This is a company that's evolving. Executive Chairman, 62. Senior Vice President, 63. Vice President, 66. Senior Vice President, 53. Chief Financial Officer, Finance and Operation, 53. list goes on and on and on, right? These are not young Googles. These are not young startup people. This is not the young Steve Jobs, right? This is, this is the old retirement age. These people should be retiring. 71, 70. Why are they still working there? Anyway, they're probably doing a good job. I'm not saying they're doing a bad job. Um, just because they're old, but are they really a young, evolving company if everyone on your board is 60 and 70? I don't know. Doesn't add up. And again, Magnus isn't saying he's done all the work himself. He's, we're, we're, don't want to give him all the credit, right? Jim Chanos, the guy who called out Enron, is saying this is his favorite short of all time. <clears throat> that means a lot. So of course, he, he's been wrong many, many times, but, uh, Overall, he's made really good money, and uh, he do, he has uh, I think um, in his short only fund he has a short only fund, and then he has a short fund that's short individual stocks, okay, but long the market, okay. So basically, he's 190 percent long the market, and then 90 percent short. I think something like that. So it takes a short the funds from going short and invested uh, in the stock market, and in the index in the indexes, and. Um, yeah, it's, it's his favorite short now, and he has, I think, 20 shorts or something uh, at any time. Mm -hmm. Maximum 5% of his, of his portfolio. And okay. His, uh, yeah. So this is one of many of his shorts. He's putting 5% in this, so he's got 19 others. But he says out of those 20, this is his favorite. This is his number one out of 20. That's what it said. Yeah. So it says, um, he also predicted the wire card scandal in uh, Germany. Okay. If you... Uh, remember that one last year okay it's a European uh, thing gotcha but anyway we're not saying it but Jim Chanos is saying it we're repeating what Jim Chanos says Wayne asked Jim is 64 years old why do you believe him but he's not running the company right he's not running IBM which is supposed to be a tech company which is supposed to be evolving anyway that's just my opinion Jim is a trader and he continues to trade but like he says Jim is 64 years old why do you believe him by the way just a quick interruption we've got one minute before the bell opens uh, I do want to remind you guys to support us you can go down to the description below and find the links we also got a tip jar but do check out the optionsoracle.com they've got a 30-day free trial you can use it make money only ninety seven dollars to continue forward as soon as the market opens we're gonna look at managing our positions Says Wayne Bicknell says, but you are telling us that he is evaluating this company. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, market's open. CLS got filled. I had to close early on that one. <coughs> going through. Looks like we're going to open up a little bit green. Geo popped up a lot, but Geo was okay. I've got a covered call on this one. And still well below my trading price. I got to look back and see how much I entered that one in. I've got nine days left on that. All right. Cryptocurrency mining stocks. Riot and Mara took a hit yesterday. They're popping back up again. Sage has been doing good for me. Got a $50 put on that. It's already at $74.86. I've got no worries there. Give me a second. Let me make sure. Yeah. So Sage has been a great winner for us. Gonna let that continue to ride. We've got nine days left on that. 
surprised that there's still so much value even on this put option. We opened it for 457, it's down only 50%. We've hold it for 40 days. It's well above the put. It's just a lot of volatility keeping that high. Well, we're happy to let that expire and collect the full value. Rigel, 100 shares, that's a covered call. We already got assigned on that in the past. Now we're turning around and selling the covered call to get out of it. Uh, looks like that's gonna expire in nine days and we'll be able to resell that again. MU is going great for us. Opened at $1.26. Could close it right now if we wanted to at 37. Only got nine days. Gonna try and let that ride out or close it for five cents. By the way, for those of you who are new to the wheel, do keep in mind it is not a good idea or good strategy to wait till the end. Always, in my opinion, close, whether it's for a penny or five pennies, depending upon how much you opened it for. Obviously, if you opened it for 15 cents, might not be worth closing the last day at five cents. But you don't want to, it's not worth the dollar, right? One penny is one dollar. It's not worth the dollar to let it try and expire all the way out because options trading is going to stop about four o'clock. It's at four, four thirty, but it's going to stop at four o'clock. And then the stock is going to continue the trade. If any bad news comes out, you're going to have no way of fixing that position. You can actually get assigned even after the option market has closed, which is why we always buy to close early for a penny or, or a little bit more, right? I open this at $1.26. I'm happy to close at any time for five cents. I'm not going to hold on to five. I'm not going to risk $121 just to get that extra $5. So I'm going to collect that $5 and get, it on, get on with my life and go roll it forward. Kodak back up to 1014. I've been uh, selling uh, covered calls on this to try and break even out of this for a while now, and I'm ready to let that go. Virgin Galactic continues its massive run up. Let's uh, shorten that chart. We were selling the puts. We sold the puts at 23 and a half, 21. I own a call that I bought way back in December, right? That is a two-year call, so I got plenty of time to let that play out. But these puts are definitely going to expire worthless as long as things keep going. The test flight was successful. We watched it go from $17, $18 to $25, hit $30, come back down, and now continue to go up $38, going up like a rocket. Get it? Sorry, that's terrible, right? Anyway, AI. We've got a crazy bull spread, and I've closed a couple of the wings on that. I'm gonna have to figure out how to manage that, but I got 37 days. And look at that over the weekend. Arc G Genomics, we've got a covered call being sold. That's actually going against us, but the price is going up, so that's okay. And we're happy to, we're okay losing a, 100 shares and collecting that premium. Sorry, collecting that appreciation and that premium. BNGO, we've got active puts on them, five and seven. We're at 8.33, well out of the money on that. Jay Gain says, WWE stock up 15% and climbing. Thoughts, question, rumor is Vince may be selling the company soon. I know nothing, I didn't watch, I, I watched the old Hulk Hogan stuff and I didn't really watch anything in uh, wrestling after that. But let's go check it out in a second. Let's continue managing our positions. It's 9.34. We've only got 15, 11 more minutes with you guys. Feel free to chime in on anything or just sure. sit back and watch. Uh, we got the $5 put. We opened at 60, currently at 19. The $7 put, 85 and 75. We got 37 days left on this. I probably want to close this one early. BNGO, 0.19 versus 0.61. We're going to get 70% of our value uh, out of 16 days, out of 45 days. That seems like it's worth it. <coughs> well, I'll tell you what, that's actually gone up a bit. 19, do, 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 do. We we'll probably won't get closed at 19. We'll probably end up at the 22. But well, we're going to consider that one. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. You can see I've got it actively working here to try and close at five cents, and that's good to close, so if it happens any time, we might let that just continue to roll. voozy has been an up and down one for us. We've sold the covered call at 24. We got assigned at 22, but I think I collected enough premium on that that it doesn't really matter. 
Boozy, I got a dollar fifty-five at the twenty-two. So my real break-even is about twenty forty-five. Twenty forty-five. We're at eighteen plus a dollar. Now we're still losing money on that one, but we're gonna try and climb our way out month by month. Thirty-seven days left to roll on that one. Poly P O L Y. We've got an active covered call on that one. Dollar twenty-five. Now worth a three dollars and seventy cents. That means it's up and above our covered call. We got assigned at 35, not counting all the premium, so we're happy to just let that play out. That's Plantronics, the maker of headsets that all the call centers use. Good company. <clears throat> we can go either way on this. We're happy to hold the shares or let the covered call get taken away. Jay says, WWE now up 19%. That's fantastic. Do you own, uh, do you own shares on it or are you just looking to, to wheel it? Disney continues to climb. We sold to 165, now at 176. We got 72 days left. When I saw that pop on the premium on this, I went ahead and locked out 90 days. So that's one of the strategies that I use. When we see a good company, especially, and the IV pops, you could do weeklies. But here's the here's the thought process. Some people think, oh, I'm going to make more money more money if I do the weeklies because I'm going to get you know two percent a week instead of five percent a month, so I'll get eight percent. But that's only if the IV stays constant. In order for the IV to stay constant, it needs to continue to oscillate. If you're dealing with a company like Disney that doesn't oscillate that much, when you see a spike in implied volatility, I like to go further out, sell the 90 day, and lock in that value because it's gonna, as it stops oscillating, that IV is gonna come down, you're gonna get less and less premium. So that 2% in a week goes down to 1.5, down to one, down to half, and you're not gonna get the full value out of it like I am here. I sold this for 560. I could close it early if I want. Collect two dollars and forty, two dollars and thirty-five cents. No, forty-five. Two dollars and forty-five cents. Two hundred and forty-five bucks per contract. I probably should have done more on this, but I'm happy with what I got going because it's working out in my favor. In Odata, this is just a buy and hold one for me. I'm happy to see it's finally going in my direction. This was a little bit up and down, a little bit choppy. Now I've already doubled my money, and we're going to continue to let that ride. NBEV, New Age Beverage Company. We got open at 234, it's at 254, just holding the shares on that one. Tesla, I just put one in here so I can keep track of it without opening up my other spreadsheets or without opening up my other trading platforms. They cannot seem to get above, cannot seem to stay above 610 now. Riot's recovering back to 29. We've just got empty shares on that one. Ignore this trade price, guys. I did, uh, so here's something I did. When this went sky high, it had insane volatility, and it was up here at the bit, at the $70. Mm -hmm. So I sold one at the money, which you know, almost I never do. But I also reached all the way back and sold nine out of the money, and used those nine to pay and guarantee these free shares. And I was hoping it'd go either way. Either I end up as long as it doesn't go down too far, right? Those other nine expired worthless, and I got to buy this one at 70 minus the premium, which is like $18 or something crazy, like AMC type value, but an actual good company, okay? <coughs> but those other nine paid for all of these shares. So these shares are completely free, I can just let it ride forever. Amazing. Yeah. And MNKKQ, still delisted, terrible trade, never should have done that one. <clears throat> All right, let's go check out the WWE. Thank you, Jay. And by the way, we've got five more minutes with you guys. If you have any more questions or comments or stocks you want us to go look at, now is the time to do it. So uh, one company I also see, we just need to talk briefly about. Sure. Um, after this. Okay, yeah. So we've got <laughs> at the money, Currently trading at 69, so we're actually closer to at the money at the 70. Let's delete that. We gotta subtract 50 cents because it's in the money a little bit, so we're saying four dollars at the 70. That's a five that's still only a 5.7% return. So Jay, we're only seeing 5.7% return at the money. So we're not and it's coming down a little bit. So it's gonna be hard to get four or five percent out of the money when you're only getting five percent at the money. We also see that they've got dividends coming up on June 14th. 
you probably, you, I don't know if this is the X date or the dividend payout date. This is probably the X date, so you want to own those shares before the 14th. Then you've got earnings coming out July 29th. That is after our, our 37 day option here at July 16th. What's the company you want to talk about? C Limited. C, just <coughs> C symbol, right? So this is um, a holding company. Citigroup? No. S E S, like C, like the ocean. Okay, S E A. Okay. I think the ticket might be S E. <laughs> okay. uh, sorry, the company name is C. C Limited ADR. Okay, so it's okay. Uh, out of the UK, right? Uh, it's a Singapore company listed on New York Stock Exchange. Okay. I think. Maybe it's listed on Glass too. <clears throat> so they have three businesses Garena is a gaming company. Okay, Garena. <clears throat> they have Shopee, which is an e commerce uh, player in Southeast Asia. And they're also going to go into Brazil. And they have an e like a e wallet uh, digital money play in Southeast Asia as well called Shopee Pay, and uh, the gaming business is, is very profitable, uh, and they're using that to cross subsidize their e commerce and e wallet business in Southeast Asia, and I believe it is uh, overpriced. I'm shorting this company, uh, and and um, <clears throat> they're operating in, in several markets in Southeast Asia. But the crown jewel is Indonesia, where we are at now, and uh, I've been watching them uh, in, in Jakarta and around Indonesia, and it's, it's been a crazy price war with subsidies uh, on, on e-commerce, um, free delivery, discounts, merchant discounts, uh, crazy cashbacks if you use these e-wallets to, to buy things, 30% cashback. The burning money like crazy. Why do, why do they do thirty percent? That's just to get people onboarded. It's like a marketing thing, or <clears throat> yeah, they they want to get people to switch because they were they were a late player into the e wallet game in Indonesia. Okay, they have the Gojek, their hair grab. Gojek, by the grab, way, have, um, Gojek is absolutely huge here, and everybody pretty much loves it. We use Gojek for food, for transport, for delivering items. It's it's like a better version of Grab and Uber, and also other things. Yeah, you think it's better than Uber? That's, that's cool. And they do more things. They have more features. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So they were a late player into the e wallet game, and they decided to aggressively burn money to to take a position there. And they're they're gaining market share rapidly, but at what cost? And and I also know Indonesian consumer behavior uh, a bit from being here three three and a half years, and we have so many office workers in Jakarta, for example, in the capital. Every day they commute uh, back and forth to the office and home. They would open up the Grab app, the Uber app, and Gojek. They would they would plot in the route in each app, which was the cheapest. Okay, I'll take that one. Every day, right. going to the office and going back. This is an extremely price sensitive consumer. And, and how much no they, loyalty, zero loyalty. And how much would they even be saving by by opening up all three of them and choosing which one? They, if they could save uh, 10 cents, mm -hmm. you know, they would take Grab instead of Gojek. It's all about uh, price. Extremely. I mean, they would switch, they would, they would look at three different e-commerce sites just for buying like a t-shirt or, or a shirt, right? Right. They don't value their time. I mean, they, they're very poor, right? They don't have much money. Right. But they have time. So they're, they're going to so, save every penny that they can. <clears throat> they're not going to have any brand loyalty to Garena or Shopee or anything like that. They're just going to continuously look and compare and go with whatever's cheapest, right? The e-commerce and, and the the, the e-wallet thing, I, mm -hmm. I think is a. I'm, I'm very skeptical if it's a good business. And of course, it's a bet to become the market leader, right? But then you become a market leader in in a in a quite poor country. Let's be honest. I mean, yes, it's growing. The middle class is growing, but there's, it's so price sensitive. The the basket sizes are so small for e-commerce here. It's just really hard to do e-commerce um, in, in these markets. So um, they're losing yeah. they're losing about 400 million a quarter between 400 and 500 million a quarter. So let's call it 450. They've got a lot of cash on hand. So we take 3000 sorry 6 billion 62 divided by 450 let's call it. They've still got about 13 14 quarters of cash on hand before they ever have to issue any shares or take on any more debt. They've got about, they do are high on debt though, they got about 68 I think is what it came out to. But they've got a lot of cash on hand, they can continue to burn this another 13 quarters before they have to worry about anything. Right. 
But what's your play? You're gonna, you're gonna. Sh have you actively shorted them already? I'm short. I'm short now. I started shorting them a month ago. Yeah. Um. So I mean, you look at the stock price. It's it's been going up. I think nine x in in the last year or so. Wow. Since April 2020. Since yeah. COVID. The, it's being priced you know, to take over the world. Um. <laughs> so yeah. Man. Yeah. You could have bought so, this so, at forty three dollars I mean, even before COVID. And it's never had a major pullback even during COVID. It's actually just shot up from, like you said, six X or whatever. Yeah. And and the thing is, uh, they're they're uh, what is it called? They're they're losing money for every dollar they sell in their e-commerce business, right? So right. They have a operational loss. Uh, the more they sell, the more they lose, and their their e-commerce business is growing much much faster than their gaming business, which is profitable, it is. And I think that is part of the reason that it has extremely high valuation because they have this cool setup where they have a gaming business, which is profitable, subsidizing this e-commerce business. Uh, but I think that's priced in way, uh, way long time ago. And um, what was I gonna say? Yeah, I'm just just being here on the ground in Nisha. I think uh, I'm just very skeptical that this will ever be a very very good business. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's yeah, and and, and not, not a big factor. Uh, two of the large unicorns in Indonesia, Gojek and Tokopedia. Gojek, uh, the uh, Uber uh, local Uber competitor, and Tokopedia local Amazon uh, player, they merged. And in and these are these are really big, really popular companies, right? When I order something. There's not, there's no Amazon here. It's Tokopedia, and like one other site, but mo I, mostly it's Tokopedia. The Tokopedia's got the nicer UI and Gojek. If I want food, if I want anything, if I want to send a package or send money to somebody, I'm using Gojek. And those two companies, if Amazon and Grab, an actual profitable Grab, I think, unlike Grab, I don't think Grab is profitable. But I think Gojek is profitable, right? But, Certain parts of Grab is profitable, but overall they're losing a lot of money. Of right. Yeah. But if you took the two biggest players, right? You took Amazon and Grab and mashed them together. That's what GoTo is, I think what they're calling it, Gojek and, and Tokopedia. Those two yes. companies are merging together and then doing an IPO. But anyway, yeah. sorry, continue. Yeah. One difference is that Gojek and Tokopedia are very Indonesia focused. Indonesia is the fourth most populous country in the world, so it's a big market, but they're only in this, this market. And they're the local player, and they, in countries like Indonesia, there's a huge regulatory arbitrage or regulatory advantage for being the local company because local politicians are cheering for you. Yeah. And if you're the foreign player, Uber, uh, Uber Uber lost here. They couldn't they couldn't compete here. They got outbid. They got consumed and exactly they sold everything and left. Yeah. And they burned so much money. I was on the ground in Jakarta uh, taking a motorcycle taxi, paying I think like 10 cents to take a motorcycle taxi for 15 minutes which is oh that's that's great it yeah, was great now madness. it's a dollar now it's a dollar 10 times higher now because the competition is gone exactly but i remember when people you could see lots of things you could see the uber you could see the grab you could see the gojek and now i, I rarely see one in ten drivers have grab it's almost all gojek at least here in chengu true yeah i don't see much grab anymore yeah, but remember you used to see uber now of course you see no uber but i don't see much grab either it's True. it's all about Gojek. Yeah, I but know. some of them do both, right? They're they're on both, and then they just switch the jack. They got both fo fo like the drivers. They got both phones open. They got two phones, and they're looking for whatever fastest one they get. And if it's grab, they change helmet. Exactly. <laughs> Again, no uh, not much loyalty. Very little loyalty, right? I talked to some some people using Shopee, and I mean they're using it because it's the cheapest. It's the most subsidized, and they're using the investors' money to subsidize in Asian consumers. Yeah. And if I were an Indonesian consumer, I'd be very happy, right? It's great for them, but I wouldn't be an investor in yep. this company. So if you're so interested now. in shorting some companies, do check out SE. Consider IBM. Look, I'm not shorting IBM. Uh, here's my thing. Here's my theory and my philosophy with shorting. I don't like it. It's super hard unless I know of a major catalyst that's going to cause it to go down. Because what I fa what I found. Like go back to COVID, right? I knew about COVID in January 25th. I was actually trying to short the market correctly. I did it incorrectly, but here's what I found. When you try and short a company, the PR department has dry powder they're gonna use against you. The CEO has sales agreements, dry powder that he's gonna use against you. 
the president of the United States or whatever country you're dealing with, they're going to try and boost the economy. They're going to say something to make the economy and the stock market go up. The Federal Reserve is going to lower interest rates to make the market go up. When you try and short, it's you versus the world. Everyone else is against you. It's super, super hard to time it correctly and you're paying monthly until it works. And every time it goes up, you have to re-margin the account, you have to put in money because you're actively losing money until it finally does go down. So I don't short anymore unless I have a really big catalyst that's gonna drive it down. Do you know of anything that's gonna make either IBM or SE suddenly fall off that cliff and happen right now or soon? So, um, for me, the Gojek Tokopedia merger was, was really uh, positive, I think, in this case because they're forming a strong local uh, competitor in their key market. I mean, because this is out made, of where's C out of Singapore? Singapore based. So they're, they're not in local to Indonesia. Indonesia right? Exactly. Right. They're so a foreigner. For so for those of you guys who know or don't know, Singapore is close to Indonesia. But when we're saying local, we don't mean Western versus Eastern. We're talking Indonesia versus Singapore. Yeah. And this company's foreign to Indonesia, so they're not going to get the special treatment that Gojek and Tokopedia is going to get. I guess it's similar to, to China, right? There's a reason that Uber pulled out of China. Maybe it's not as bad in Indonesia, maybe a little bit easier to be a foreign company, but it's still very hard to be a foreign company, gotcha. a foreign player, especially when they have a strong local player that they can protect. Yeah. You know? so, so they will do, I think they will do what they can based on experience as well. So many foreign investors have been burned in this market, uh, and this Indonesia is their main market. That's the that's main what I was story, right? That's what I was about to ask. Yeah. How much of this company is trying to be in Indonesia versus their other operations? Because if I, Indonesia is their crown jewel, yeah, that's dangerous. That's right? their crown jewel. So I think it's around 45, 50 percent of revenue is coming from Indonesia. Right. Uh, so if that I, dries up, whew. yeah. Um, it's just like it doesn't seem sustainable. The subsidizing uh, it's just uh, at a completely different level than I think what Amazon or any other player I've ever seen in my life had been doing. It's just completely off the hook. Gotcha. Uh, burning, burning money. Just too fast, huh? Yeah. Gotcha. By the way, for those of you who don't know, um, we talk about uh, number one. Garena is actually really big here. If you ever play League of Legends, you have to sign up for a Garena account. So they, they take other games and they localize it to the market. They may be involved in other games, like making their own games. So Garena is big, and that is the profitable arm of their company. But who's to say that if this starts failing, that they don't just spin that off or have to sell it or, or, or shatter the company, right? The other thing I want to say before we go, it's already 9.53. Do check out theoptionsoracle.com, sends.org, if you want to live forever. Links in the description down below, but also, Gojek and Tokopedia is the basically, I think, the two most popular, most massive companies that could merge here. And it's actually crazy to me that they were even merging. So their goal is to merge and do a simultaneous IPO in Indonesia and the New York Stock Exchange. I've heard it's supposed to happen July and August, but I've also heard from some people who might have some additional uh, knowledge in the background that that might not play out as fast as they want it to. That might be much longer down the road. It might be. You know, they might have put it out there and then it's just not going to happen, right? That, that like wishful thinking for it to happen in August. Yeah, let's see. I mean, Grab had a, had a benefit there because they had this SPAC, uh, I forgot the name of it, but, but they're basically this SPAC pur will purchase Grab, I think. And, uh, and therefore they saved a lot of that IPO time. It's quite time consuming, I think, to... Sure. To list the company, right? But in in the spec case, yeah, spec it's already zone, listed, and then yeah. you just merge into it. Re reverse takeover, I guess it's called. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for those of you that that don't get it, we want you to go check out GOTO, Gojek Tokopedia. Keep an eye on it. I'm not actually big on IPOs. I think I see a lot of IPOs. They spike on the first two or three days, and then it's just a down downtrend for a long time. But if I was going to do an IPO, this is probably the company to do it. Gojek and uh, Tokopedia, fantastic companies, right? So if I wanted to do IPO plays, this is what I would look at. Well, I mean, the, the whole ride holding uh, concept is you know, a little bit questionable whether they will ever make money, right? Um, sure. And if Uber can't make money, but, then can these guys make money? I don't know. It's I think a little bit... I'll have to look into it again, but I think they're already profitable. 
and but they do everything right if you want a massage if you want a parcel delivered if you want uh, somebody to pick you up they're doing everything out the gate and did you know they charge something like 30 percent for go food when they take the food month when they take the food from the restaurant and deliver it to you not the driver gojek is getting 30 percent of your total cost yeah that reminds me actually another company that uh, that I'm short. The last one I'm short is DoorDash. Oh yeah, uh, in, yeah, you told US, me that DoorDash. Yeah. That's maybe a story for another day. But, yeah. Uh, I think the seems like the business model is basically yeah, hard to make money uh, All right. doing that. But that's a different <laughs> a different uh, conversation, perhaps. Yep. All right, guys, we're gonna head out now. It is 9.56, we're actually 11 minutes over. I wanna thank you guys, I wanna thank you, Magnus, for being on the show today. And thank you guys for watching. Don't forget, like, subscribe, bell, sign up, click links, support, you know, all that other good stuff. Have a great day, thank you, from, thank you and goodbye from Bali. Thanks for having me, have a good uh, day. Boom, done. <laughs>